Now I'm down? Okay, well, I'll be doing that. <laughs> Hello? If you would, come on and have a seat. I have just a few announcements to make before we go into our Wednesday evening Bible study, which will be a continuation by Brother Robert of the Gospel According to John. I don't see any visitors, but if you are a visitor either in the building or streaming, you're our welcome guest if you're visiting. If you're joining us in the Wednesday night Bible study via streaming and anything is said during this lesson, if you would give the office a call, they'd be glad to give you a biblical answer for a question that you may have. We thank all of our visitors. Please keep all those with, your on, with ongoing health problems in your daily prayers. Also, please keep the missionaries that are here and the ones that are on the field and their families in your prayers. Just a reminder that the, the church's uh, annual picnic will be this coming Saturday at McCurry Park from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, we would ask you if you need to have some place to sit, if you want to be able to sit down and bring, a, bring your, most people have folding chairs, bring some chairs so that you'll be able to sit down. There'll be benches, there are a few benches and the picnic tables, but bring chairs if you need to. Also, don't forget about the dessert contest. We have a golden spatula that's just waiting to be given out because it's been sitting dormant for several years. Also, uh, the elders request that you remember always to pick up a copy of the bulletin whenever it's available on each Lord's Day because there's a calendar of event that we started putting in there, we resumed putting in there back a couple of weeks ago and we're always adding to it. Thank you very much. I believe that's all the announcements I have. If you would, bow with me. I'll open the class with a prayer, and then we'll have a song, and then I'll give it over to Brother Robert. Thank you all for being here. Let us pray. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with, Father. Each and every physical blessing, and each and every spiritual blessing each day that you bless us with, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and join our brothers and sisters and study a portion of your word. Pray that you'd be with Brother Robert as he presents this lesson. We pray that we would always all have ears to hear it, a heart to heed it, and a mind to meditate upon it, Father, and to make adjustments where we see necessary. Father, thank you so much for everything you do for us, especially the spiritual blessings, Father. Thank you for the family here, each brother and sister, Father. Thank you for each family that's represented. Father, be with us during this lesson. Thank you so much for everything you do for us, especially for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So tonight, number 316, number 316, we'll sing all three verses. Let us sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning. Leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, Leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed 
the peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. To all of you who are in the class this evening, we welcome you to the Wednesday evening Bible study and hope and pray that uh, what we study together will be uh, both enlightening. If I could just touch the hem of the garment of what our Lord and Savior did, I would be happy for that. And uh, I know that it would be effective as we study his work. I appreciate all the good Bible students, teachers, that are in this class on Wednesday evening. If you're marking your, or looking for a place to look at in your textbook, we're at the bottom of page six. We've covered six pages, but we can't get out of John chapter one. It seems, seems like if the elders will give me the okay, I may be teaching John for a whole year. I don't know, but we'll go as far as we can go. Uh, each each night we'll go as far as we can go. Uh, last week we start, we talked about those who rejected Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, is it safe to say that there are those who rejected the heavenly Father, and there are those who accepted the heavenly Father in His work? Would that be a fair statement? It seems to be that uh, from the very beginning, there are those who obeyed and there, they were, there were those who disobeyed. Last week, we did study about the coming of John the baptizer and the fact that he was sent from who? He was sent from God. Thank you, John Buckholz, David. Both of you were saying the same thing. I could hear it. Uh, and we studied how that he was not the light and he told the people, I am not the light, but rather I am coming to make his way smoother. Tonight we begin with the fifth point of this section and that is the acceptance of Christ. I want to go ahead and, and say now that there is a pivotal point. Uh, there's a pivotal point between those who reject Jesus and those who accept Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that same pivotal point is also true in our salvation. And I think I mentioned last week, without believing, uh, without faith, without believing, uh, we would not have the motivation to repent, and we would not, or we would not confess Christ or be baptized. It is the pivotal point in our salvation. But can we also say that it is the pivotal point of our seven steps to heaven according to what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1? How did he start that and add to your what? Faith. Add to your faith. So really, faith 
is that which is a motivator, it is the pivotal point of our obedience and obeying the gospel, and it is the pivotal point in our going to heaven. Sometimes we, sometimes we may be thinking about, we wish that that person, we wish that that Christian or that person would give like they should. And sometimes maybe we would say in our own minds and do all that we can to motivate them, to move them. And also even about church attendance. And you could just choose any other thing that you wanted to. But it, would it be fair to say that if our faith is what it should be, we will do what we should do? Would that be a fair statement? It is, it is the pivotal point that moves us in obedience to God whether it's our salvation of our, or our living and serving Jesus Christ. And we're going to find that true as we look not only at those who rejected Christ, and there were those who did. There were the Jews, just speaking as a whole. There were the Pharisees. There were the Sadducees. There were the Zealots and others of the Jewish sect that they rejected him. But there were Jews that accepted him. There were Jews that accepted him. And thank God for them. Tonight we'll begin to look at that. John chapter 1, and Brother Earl, would you please read verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Okay, thank you, Earl, for read it, receiving or reading those for reading those. Here we see that there were those who were accepting Jesus Christ. They would receive him. That is, uh, the word receive means they would have the power or the authority to become the sons of God. This word receive the right or the right, uh, the power or authority. And they would have the right to become the children of God. It is also good to notice here in verse number 12, to receive him is equal with believing in him. And you see that at the end of the verse. Look at verse 12 that Earl read. But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become the children of God. Even to those who what? Believe in his name. And so to receive him is to believe in him. To believe in him. That's a strong statement, isn't it? And don't we see that it is important for our faith or to be our belief For us to have it in our lives. For us to have that faith or belief. Sometimes I, I feel like through the years I have felt like that maybe we have gotten away from how strong that word belief is in our salvation and in our going to hell. And I've thought about maybe we've gotten away from it because there are those that don't properly understand it. But that should not make us shun away from the importance of believing. Because here in verse 12, we see the importance of it, that we must believe in his name. If we're going to have the right to become the children of God, the, the pivotal point will be 
to receive him, and to receive him is to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of as the Son of God. Now, just to carry this thought a little bit farther, he makes a statement here: the right, the right, uh, the power, the authority to become the children of. God, and I'm going to come back to you and, and get your comments in a moment. One thing I want us to think about is how do we become the children of God today? How do we become the children of God? We know it's through hearing the gospel. We know it's through believing the gospel and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God by repenting of our sins, turning away from them and turning to God, to confess Jesus as the Lord, the master and the ruler and the controller of our lives, and then by being buried with Christ in baptism. But to put it in a nutshell, hold your place here in John and go over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 26 and 27. John, read that for us. So you see, this is in harmony with what we see in John chapter 1 and verse number 12. Those who have the right to become the children of God, the authority, the power, they are those who believe. But it must be, it must be a believing, it must be a, a action of believing. It must be an action. We can read the book of James and uh, we can know that faith without Action or works is dead, is dead. So the word believing here is an action word that includes, that is inclusive of action behind. Don't we see that in that great chapter on that great listing of heroes of faith of the Old Testament? Don't we see that over and over in, in, in that chapter? That it was their strong faith or believing that was an action that they put together with an action that led them to be victorious in whatever they did. Brother Franklin Camp used to say that the book of Joshua is about the people of God walking by faith coupled together with action. Coupled together with action. Isn't that really true? Beginning with Joshua and them conquering, beginning to conquer the promised land. So we can see how important it is. But we see it coupled together there in Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. Now, he makes another statement that Brother Earl read in verse 13. Look back at verse 13. Those who become the children of God are those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they are born by what? The will of who? The will of God. You see, our salvation, our being born again, and Nicodemus will learn this in John chapter 3, that it is a spiritual new birth and not a physical new birth. And it is according to the will of God. Now, what I want us to do is to look at 1 Peter. Just hold your place there in John. And go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, 
So, as soon as someone gets there, read it for us. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Yes. 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 The, in John 1, verse 13, Yes, we're still born of God, but it is not a physical birth. Yes, 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 yes. And we're going to see how we are born. And it, isn't it important to see how that we are born according to the will of God? Someone read that, First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. And 23, and Earl, thank you for making that comment. Good comment. Hmm. Okay. So according to these two verses, how, how, how are we born again? Okay. All right. Can we say by the word of God? Yes, because isn't it the word of God that tells us that we must be baptized? And we're going to get more into this in John chapter 3 when we come to the story of Nicodemus and his encounter with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, could we say that's going back to what Earl said, the comment? In other words, it was not a fleshly seed line. It was in the old covenant. It was a fleshly seed line of Judaism or the Jews. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the what? Through the word of God, through the word of God. And so it is through the word of God and what it says to give us direction. Isn't it the word of God that gives us a direction such as Galatians 3, 26 and 27, by faith and baptism, you become the children of God. Isn't it God's word that reveals that to us? And when it reveals it to us, and we let it be planted in our hearts, it will make us what? It'll make us what? Chil yeah, it'll make us children of God. So, here in John chapter 1, we find those who accept Christ. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, there's some key word, there's a key word, there are key words, or there are key phrases in these two verses. Becoming the children of God the right, that is the power or the authority, and by whose authority do we become the children of God? By whose authority? By man? No. But by the will of who? By the will of God. Okay, if you're using a textbook, you might uh, go ahead and be turning over to page 7 if you're using it. And if you would like to have a textbook, I still have those that are available to you. Uh, we will be getting now into a little bit more uh, the incarnation. Right up in the front of this gospel that God gave through the Holy Spirit to the Apostle John. 
right up in the front end. He's going to say, here's a major premise. And then he's going to go about it to prove it. Now, there are, there are other things that are involved in that. But he's going to say it in the beginning of chapter 1, in verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, what, about, what about the light? In the beginning. Uh, let there be light. Who created the light? Who created the light? Jesus. Very good, John. Yes, Jesus. In other words, the Logos, the Word, created that light. He would say, and we've already looked at Colossians what is it, chapter 1, verse 15, 16, and 17 that shows us that Jesus Christ was the creator. He was the one that breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. And all of this is said to show that Jesus existed before he was born of Mary. That he is eternal. He was with God in the bosom of God, and John is going to say that soon, before the world even began. Would someone please read John chapter 1 in verses 14, down, verse 14 down to 18. Someone read that for us, and let's all follow along as, as they read. Thank you, David. So in verse 14, and the word, what word is he referring to? Yes, very good, very good, Albert. We go back to verse 1. In the beginning was the word, verse 1. And here in verse 14, and the word became flesh, John says, and dwelt among us. There are a number of things that would show us that it's referring to Jesus Christ. In verse 14 itself, what are some things in verse 14 would tell us that it is talking about Jesus Christ? Became flesh. Okay, dwelt among us. Anything else? We beheld his glory. I, yes, I heard uh, over here Pearl, I think, too, saying it. Uh, and what is the other thing? That's a strong one. What is the other one? Okay, that's the, that, that's the how do you say it? That's the killer point, isn't it? I mean, that's the killer point. He's the only one begotten of the Father. And so John tells us we beheld his glory, in John chapter 1, in verse 15, John bore witness of him. Remember, there are two words that we're going to find over and over again. Believe is a common word in the gospel according to John. It is mentioned, I believe, some 98 times. Does that mean it's important? Yeah, it is that many times, the word believe. But there is also this word witness. And you will see, John, that he will use the word witness. Look down at verse 19. Now this is the what? The testimony, the record. I think the old King James says the record. So the word witness in the new King James and the word 
testimony. He is going to use them. And both of these words are used in an inspired manner or way in the book of John. Now notice here also in verse 14 that John says that he is the only one begotten of the Father. What we do, we see John, we see Jesus rather, incarnated, that is, he became flesh. And he's the only begotten of the Father. Uh, can someone tell us, and we don't have to turn there and read it in this class, but it's good for even the younger ones to pick up on it. How did God go about bringing about the birth of his only begotten son? Did he use Joseph to do it? What did he do, Earl? Exactly. And you're going to read that in Matthew's account, Mark's account, and Luke's account. Without taking the time to go to those, you will see that he will use the Holy Spirit to impregnate Mary. And when Mary realizes that she is pregnant with a child, and she learns a lot about that child, it's going to be a man-child, and they're going to call his name Jesus. But she's also going to be told by who that God has impregnated her through the Holy Spirit. Who tells her that? Joseph? Huh? The angel, the angel of the Lord reveals that to her. This is an inspired message to Mary that this is something that God has taken care of. Now, in John chapter 1 and verse 15, John the baptizer says of the Son of God that he is what preferred, take the time to look up this word, that he is preferred. He ranks higher. He ranks higher. He is superior. He is superior. What makes Jesus superior? What makes Jesus superior to John the Baptist? What makes him superior? Okay. He's the only begotten son of who? Was he deity? Yes, he was deity. And we see in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, Theos, and the word was God, Theos. That means that he was a divine deity, one of divine origin. And we must see that. That's what, isn't that what made him superior to John the baptizer? Yes, it was. That's what set him apart from every human being on the face of the earth. He is the only one that is set apart and made more superior. Is he not? How do we know he's the only one? Well, look at verse, look at verse 14. The only begotten of the Father. Not a small, minute thing, a very important thing. Okay, I thought I saw a hand over here somewhere. Yes, sir. How did they know? Yeah. All right. Very good question, sir. Do, do you, everybody hear her? Uh, did, did the angel appear as a ghost or a person? Now, we've already touched on this some, haven't we? What about in the Old Testament? Did the angel always appear as an angelic being? What? No. Remember those three men that 
sit with Abraham, they were in human form. And uh, so the angels not always took on the form of an angelic being. And I saw another hand come up. Uh, but Casper the Gully. That's the only one I think of. Okay. Angels were angelic beings. Can I leave it like that? Or somebody got another comment they want to make. Uh, angels did show themselves in different forms throughout the Old Testament. Stephen then Earl. Okay, and who is Gabriel, Steve? There's something unique about Gabriel. He is the one that stood in the presence of who? Of, of Jehovah God, the Heavenly Father. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Earl, you had another comment. <laughs> no. I thought about that a second. Yes. Well, Sherelle, let, let's keep it, let's keep it the way people use the word ghost today. Am I right? Let, let's keep it the way they use it today. Uh, a ghost. Uh, but uh, we know that angels were angelic beings. I mean, you can study the Bible cover to cover, and you know that they were angelic beings, right? Were they heavenly beings? Yes. And even the ones that took an exit at God's command, they were, while they were in heaven, they were angelic beings. Now, what happened to them altogether? I don't go into that one right now. So ho hopefully that can be uh, helpful. Any other comments to add to what Steve did and and Earl did. Yeah, I like that Earl. We, well, we never read that they were ghosts. Or had they had ghostly features. Yeah. It seems to be that in every case they knew they were angelic beings. Am I right? The, all that that I can remember from all the different scriptures and Old or New Testament, they they sensed that they were angelic beings. Uh, not like Sister Ethel Hamilton that lived with us for twenty years, and every night she slept with her head on the Bible. And I said, Ethel, why do you sleep with that Bible? It can't just the word can't just get in your head from you sleeping on it. She said, oh no, I'm afraid of the ghost of John Hamilton going to come back and do something to me. That was her husband that she loved dearly, Isabel. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, I, I quite agree with that overall generic statement. I certainly do. Now, another thing we've got to remember when we look into that John chapter 1 and verse number 15, when John the baptizer says the Son of God, that he is preferred 
superior before me. We've got to remember to take it in the context that he is the, 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 the pre-existence of Christ, that he is the great, that he is the great I am. Now, the Son of God declares to us the Father. And that's why God sent him. That's why God sent his only begotten Son in the flesh. Look at verse 17. And verse 18 as well. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. What does the word declare mean? What does that word declare mean? To point out, to tell about, to show about. Yeah, to show about. So John says in verse 18, the Son of God declares to us the Father. You remember what Exodus 33 and 20 says? If someone is there, read it. If someone is already there on your notepad or in your Bible, please read it. John Maynard, are you there? No, you're not. You're still stuck on that verse 18. Okay. Okay. Uh, Exodus 33, verse 20. Okay, go ahead, David. John, uh, David has it over here. Okay, so this was set from the beginning. Am I right? This was really set from the very beginning that God... No one to have that, what's the best way to say it? For no one to have that intimate relationship with him in a personal way. Am I saying it okay? Uh, only the Son of God. That's what he means by it in verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the what? Who's in the bosom. In other words, he is, he is very intimate with the Father. He's very close. He's, very, he's right with the Father in every respect. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Turn too many pages. John 14 and someone read verse 8 and 9. John 14 verse 8 and 9. Now, what is he talking about? I mean, you've been with me all this time and you say, show me the Father. He said, you've seen me. What is he talking about? Is he talking about the way Jesus physically looked? No, I'm glad for those no's over here on the side. The no's over here. The yes is over here. Okay. Uh, he said, no. But what's he talking about? Character, all right. Uh, many years ago, I did a study of the attributes of Jehovah God, the Heavenly Father, and of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Guess what the attributes were? The Son. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I won't go down through the long listing. They cover a whole page, two columns of a, of a whole page. Maybe even I didn't get them all. But they were the attributes, right? The attributes. And when he says this to John, or to Philip, he's talking about the attributes. The attributes of the Father. The attributes of the Son. And I will also say that most on all, nearly all of the same attributes that the Father had and the Son had, guess what, with the Holy Spirit. I had the same. I, they had the same. And I, I did a pretty exhaustive listing of those. So in verses 14 to 18, we see that the Son of God is portrayed as being incarnate. That is, 
that he is born. Now he's taken on a, a fleshly form. And the, the, word, the phrase, the Son of God, is mentioned some 18 times in the book of John, in the, in the gospel according to John. Some 18 times, the Son of God. Now, in Luke's account, you'll find a phrase emphasizing the humanity of Jesus, and it will be what kind of phrase? The Son of Man, the Son of Man. But we cannot lose sight all through the gospel according to John, and it's going to get really like, it's going to get repetitive. I mean, he's going to make major premise syllogism form points conclusion undeniable and he's going to do it again and again and again in different ways in different ways but don't be get tired of it because John is wanting to show us that he is the one and the only son of God you know I often think about many of these other religions of the world many religions of the world some of them have great founders. They were way beyond their time in some ways, intellectually and what they did, but what a disaster they ended up being by leading people in the wrong way. Mohammed, one of them, what a rat he was. And I say that very kindly, not in a hateful, loving way I wish bad upon him, but he just copied in his own words much of the old covenant and brought it into the Koran. He was a rascal in doing that. But not only him, the one, the finally, when Mohammedism was becoming very worldwide and becoming very deathly to the world, there was one that came out of Mohammedism and uh, started another group. Do you remember who that was? Buhala, the one that started the Baha'i faith. And again, when you write, read the writings, and I have happened to read both of them, I read the Quran because living in Fiji like we did, I wanted to know when I talked to my friends and people I loved greatly that were Muslims, I wanted to be able to be able to know what to say and to say it better, and to say it rightly. Well, the same thing later when I met a Baha'i, and he said, can we study together? We studied together for about a year or more. And he was really impressed with the churches of Christ. He was really impressed with Suhail Ali. He said, I am not an Iranian. I am a Persian. <laughs> he wanted you to know that he, and he's got a Persian passport. But the one that he followed, being Buhala, guess what he did? He just, he just read the Bible and the Old Testament, and again he took words that, and phrases and, and thoughts and concepts and ideas that were in the Bible, and he put them in his own handwriting. But that's, that's, you know, that can be intelligent. I mean, it took intelligence to do that, to write it even in his own handwriting. But you know what John's emphasizing, please don't get tired of it, again and again, is the only begotten Son, the one and only, the one and only Son of God. And you're going to hear that as we move away soon out of the, out of the first chapter. You'll see the many different ways, the many different ways that John is going to show this. I'm amazed that he's going to call witnesses like they're, going, they're on a witness stand when we come to John chapter 5. And he's going to call this witness and this witness and this witness and he's doing it like they're in a courtroom in John chapter 5. And again, what he's going to do, major premise, Jesus is the only son of God. And then he's going to lay out, here's the evidence in beautiful syllogism form. So, any other comments about these verses 14 down through verse 18? Any other comments?
before we move away from that. We cannot become weary of this, can we? Because it's strong. It's strong foundation of our faith. Is it not? Isn't it the strong strength of our foundation? You know what? You don't ever forget this. Think about Matthew 16 and verse 18 and 19, but especially verse 18. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And they told him. Then he said, who do you say that I am? And what did Peter say? You're the what? You're the Christ, what? The Son of God, the Son of God. And then Jesus said, upon this rock, upon that fact, not just a, a statement in the Bible, but upon that fact, I will build my church. Isn't it? Isn't it? Makes the hairs on my arm crawl. Because, because the church that Jesus built is built on the fact that he's who? He's the son of God. The only son of God. And, and that's powerful, isn't it? Was Mohammedism built upon that? Was the Baha'i built upon that? Was any man-made religion in the world built upon that? And so when we think about it, what John is writing about in the gospel according to John ought to really strengthen our faith. We can never get out of chapter 1. We're going to see some other, other major premises John will give. Steve, you think that. We're fixing to come to that when Jesus comes to John the baptizer to be baptized, a statement's going to be made. And again, that's the bottom line. I mean, uh, John's going to say, here's the event, here's the major premise, and here it is laid out, and here's the bottom line. And, and he does it so beautifully. He does it so beautifully. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead. I'm, I'm having to really hold myself back to jump ahead to chapter 5 because he calls these witnesses and uh, we're, we're going to see it as we lay it out. It, and it's powerful. It's again powerful comments, powerful proof that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. Any other comments, John? And when he's having to prove to these Jews, these Pharisees and Sadducees, by chapter 5, they're going to start after him. And then so he's got to produce the proof. And he does it with the witnesses. He does it with nature. He does it in some different ways. And to point Earl. Yes, very excellent point. Look over at Colossians. Turn with me quickly. We'll try to do this quickly and we'll all catch it very easily. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 1. And allow me to read this, please. And I can move along, I think. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible 
God, the invisible deity, the one that humans can't ever see. The firstborn, there it is. What's that word firstborn mean? Did the Jews take any importance in saying the firstborn? Did they? Oh, yes. He got all the inheritance. Unless on one occasion, uh, personally authorized by God, that it would go another direction. But that word firstborn here means that he ranks number one. He's the chief. He ranks number one. He is superior. And that's what Earl was talking about. And that's what John points out in John 1 and 15. He is preferred above me. He is superior to me. And we must see him in that way. Okay, we're going to stop here, and if you will, bow your heads with me, and we'll go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. And we can't thank you enough, Father God, for sending Jesus to this earth And making him to be sin for us that we might be right in your eyes, Father. Making him a little bit lower than the angels for a little while. So that he may bring many sons and daughters to glory. We thank you for Jesus. Who shows us the Father. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can be in the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. Help us to never be arrogant about that, but help us to thank you and praise you that, that we can, by obedience to your will and being born of the word, that we can be in your kingdom, in your church. Give us safety as we travel to our destinations. Be with all of those who of the congregation have long-going health problems or have illnesses that hinder them from being here. We thank you for every faithful member and help us to be more faithful because of who Jesus is. And for the fact that we can be in his church and represent him to the world. Help us to not just be up and down and in and out. But help us to just be diligent in our lives and living for you and serving you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, your only begotten son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank all of you for... Be